Hello and welcome back to AP World History Modern. Today we're going to do a look at Unit 8.1, setting the stage for the Cold War and decolonization. This is our second day on this topic. So we're going to, our learning objective today is to explain the historical context of the Cold War after 1945. And we're going to do some skill practice, claim development, a uh, little sourcing, that kind of stuff. Okay. So in the last session, uh, we kind of, you know, kind of introduced this video to you. I uh, suggested that you watch this video. If you scroll down on your, you know, if you scroll down on your screen, um, on the web page that you're on right now, you'll see this box, how America became a superpower. Um, right. So if we didn't watch that, uh, yes, then you know, in the last class, then we watched it today in class to kind of start off with. Um, also, just uh, kind of, you know, from from the last video, we we kind of looked at decolonization um, and just kind of did some different ways of looking at decolonization. And here are some categories of analysis. So if you didn't get that from the last video, then here are some categories of analysis when looking at methods in which decolonization take place. And if you want some kind of specific examples, then this is a place to get uh, this is uh, just something to get you started um so the thought process here is if you're ever given an essay you know on you know on, uh, the, the way in which decolonization took place um or different methods of decolonization these are some categories of analysis that get you started these are some examples that would you know that could be you know, used as evidence so ideally as you do your homeworks for this unit um, you know, as you see specific pieces of evidence that support these uh, these examples, right? Thus supporting these categories of analysis, uh, then please just be aware and, and make mental notes and uh, or take notes, you know, and categorize them appropriately. All right. So this is just kind of a different format. And notice that in my in my examples, um, I've got like date ranges, and in uh, this. You know, this image here created by, uh, you know, these maps created by Mr. Freeman. Um, you know, you can you can see just, uh, you know, how many different countries you know, are spun out of, um, you know, some of these decolonizing events. So this is why you see the, the year range, um, you know, because it is. It's a, it's a series of, of events, right? It's not a single event necessarily. Uh, so British West Africa, right? Mirage. Right. You can see all the partitioning that occurs as a result of this, and uh, you know, and then French West Africa. Okay, all right, uh, and then we see here the the nations who fought for independence. Right. So it's kind of good to to see them on the map. Right. Get a get a visual of exactly what you know where these things are. All right. So today, looking at the Cold War, and you know, and part of your homework for today was, you know, your Straya reading. Straya talks about NATO, talks about the Warsaw Pact. And there is like a kind of a vocab -y kind of word we throw out in class. Just make sure you get that. Uh, that's collective security agreement. Collective security agreement. So when you talk about NATO, you know, or the Warsaw Pact, both of these are collective security agreement alliances. Um, you know, so alliances in the past are not a, you know, are common. These are not new arrangements, um, and it's common to have alliances of one or two countries. You know that may even be collective security, um, but to see such a large collective security alliance system get put into place is uh, this is new, right? This is a change, and uh, you know, and of, of course, it's also kind of a very scary thing if you kind of think about it. You know, this means that any war that is going to happen is going to happen on a on a massive scale. Um, you know, because of the way that this arrangement was put into place. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's also probably the reason why there isn't an actual war between the Soviet Union and anyone else in Western Europe, uh, right? So why didn't the Soviets send in the troops into West Berlin uh, at any time after World War II, because that would have been exactly the same as sending the troops into New York City. So, you know, NATO, for all its scariness, probably does, you know, help prevent uh, a war. Um, you know, and there is, if you want to kind of take this just a little bit beyond, uh, you know, on December 25th in on 1991, when the Soviet Union collapses officially, 
um, you know, we do see an end of the Warsaw Pact, right? So the Warsaw Pact does come to an end. NATO does not, right? NATO does not come to an end. Um, and in that video, if you did watch the America is a Superpower video, um, you know, they do kind of talk about what happens next, like when the Cold War does come to an end. Um, so I'm actually kind of on that video right now on my other screen trying to, trying to find this. All right, so oh, I gotta get through it. Sir, influence everywhere, all the time. Instead of disbanding the massive military machine created for World War II, after the Berlin Wall fell, the U.S. put the Hoover Dam in place. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest military dam in the world. Now, Hoover Dam is the largest Presidents George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton decided that it was in both America and the world's interests for the United States, now the sole superpower on Earth, to continue actively managing global affairs. We should be and we must be peacemakers. NATO, created solely as a tool for countering the Soviet Union, stayed together and even expanded, a way of keeping European nations united in the absence of the Soviet threat. All right, so you can see when the Cold War does eventually come to an end, NATO continues. Right, NATO continues to, to survive. And you can see that in the late 1990s, let me just kind of toggle between these two images here for you. In the late 1990s, these, uh, you know, these, these Eastern Bloc countries, you often hear them referred to as Eastern Bloc countries. So these Eastern Bloc countries that used to be your Warsaw Pact countries, um, you know, so Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, you know, uh, you know the former Yugoslavia. You know the they actually join NATO, right? And uh, so we see that happen in the late '90s, um, and then in the early 2000s, kind of one up even more. Um, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. You see where those are in 2004? Um, you don't really even see them on here because they are literally part of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, so when you look at when you look at NATO, um, you know, it's Cold War rule, you know, it's post Cold War rule is is also kind of interesting. Um, you know, if you want to have some contextual understanding to why the relationship between the uh, between Russia, the Republic of Russia um, in the United States sours, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, because we were, we did have a pretty positive relationship with the with Yeltsin's regime. Um, you know, part of the reason for the souring relationship between Russia and the United States is a pretty provocative set of events that happens in the late '90s and early 2000s when NATO goes on to, you know, to swallow the former Eastern Bloc countries and literally the Baltic states, which part of used to be part of the Soviet Union. Right, so the story of the of NATO in the Cold War don't simply end because of the Cold War. Right, so that is something that kind of continues to this day, and uh, and still exists. Right, still exists to this day. All right. So, but anyway, we're going to focus on the Cold War. So, if we're looking at the Cold War, just kind of big stuff. There's a couple of different categories of analysis, you know, that you can kind of use to do this. Um, you know, one is proxy wars. Right, proxy wars. Um, you know, when you talk about proxy wars, you're talking about uh, one of the two sides, right? Either the Soviet Union or the United States fighting in a war against uh, somebody else who is being supplied, usually weapons and whatnot, uh, from the other side, right? So in the case of Korea, right? So the Korean War is a proxy war with the United States on one side, um, with North Korea being supplied by the Soviets. On the other side, um, you know, and uh, at least that's how it starts. And then about a year or so into it, the United States is going to get too close to the Chinese border. The Chinese are going to warn, um, you know, the American alliance. And you're going to see the Chinese get involved. Um, right. So the, you know, the Korean War is a proxy war with Soviet weapons and actual, you know, one year old China. Um, right, because remember, 19 October 49 is a declaration of the People's Republic of China in Tiananmen Square. So, a very young China will go head to head against the United States in the Korean War and bring the United States to a draw, right? So, it'll result in a stalemate, and uh, which from, from the Chinese perspective is actually a pretty impressive feat. Um, 
right? So Korean War, right? So that's kind of a proxy war. Uh, the North Vietnam, right? So sorry, the Vietnam War. So uh, the Vietnam War here, once again, a proxy war with the United States on one side with our allies. Um, and we're fighting against, uh, this is Ho Chi Minh, the Nationals. We talked about this in a previous video. Um, you know, and of course, he is being supplied with weapons from the Soviets and supplied, you know, a lot of technical advice also from the Chinese, right, the, from the PRC, um, you know, in the case of that. And of course, Afghanistan, um, right, so the Afghan war. So, you know, in the case of the Afghan war, you have uh, the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, right, invading Afghanistan here. And you know the uh, you know the proxy part is is through you know, from the United States, uh, and there was a movie made about this uh, you know a while back, um, but I, I don't think I have ever had a single student who's ever actually seen Charlie Wilson's War. Um, so, but there was a movie, and it's actually a pretty star-studded cast. Um, you know, and uh, so it's kind of surprising more people haven't seen it. Oh, let me just kind of pull it up again and just give you a just give you a glimpse of of what it looks like. Um, so I'll pull up the uh, oh you can't pull up the IMDb page. So all right, well, let me just pull the trailer, I guess, because I can always pull trailers. All right, so let's just let's, let's just kind of watch this for a second. If my internet doesn't freeze. Congressman, no, no, no. You get to call the shot. Can we uh, get your drink? It's 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm having some serious buffering issues here. Time to do this. Yes. All right. So, anyway. You can probably do this better than me, and it looks like I'm about to freeze everything. So hopefully I can close this without losing everything. All right. So anyway, Charlie Wilson's War. <laughs> I'm just made about that. But if you watch that, it does uh, it does explain you know how uh, you know how the money was funneled out of the congressional budget um, into the CIA, how the CIA acquired the weapons, um, you know how the weapons were brought into Pakistan and then brought across the Hindu Kush into the into Afghanistan. And then, you know, trained, you know, they were then, you know, given to the Mujahideen and the Mujahideen was trained on how to use them. Um, so it does kind of explain how that whole proxy war system works. Um, not a crazy exciting movie, but anyway. All right, so when we talk about proxy wars, there's that. Um, you know, there's, a, there's another category of analysis which I don't have on here, but these are like your standoffs with tensions and like the, the Cuban Missile Crisis you know, would kind of fall under that kind of category where you do have a head-to-head -head standoff between the Russians and the Soviets, um, you know, that, you know, that result in, you know, uh, an increase in tension, uh, but both sides eventually back off. So, you know, we, we do have a series of those events as well. Uh, the last kind of, you know, the last kind of category of analysis, the third category of analysis are these kind of struggle of, you know, of, of symbolic victories. Um, you know, so the space race, right? Space race is one with you know, Sputnik and the moon landing and the such. Uh, the Olympics, right? The Olympics are always fertile grounds for these symbolic global victories. Um, you know, and, and it's hard for students today to imagine how big of the Olympics were for your, uh, if your parents are older, right? your parents' generation or definitely your grandparents' generation. Um, you know, and, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, access to, to the internet. You know, it's it's not like the you know, the way I the way I typically describe it in class is, you know, I I, I typically uh, you know think back to when I was a kid. You know, I as a kid I grew up with uh, four channels. You know, we had ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS. Uh, we pulled that off the antenna, right? So you know, so as a kid we had four channels growing up. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and that was. There wasn't uh, much TV choice, uh, you know, as a kid. I mean, I remember I would get home from school. If my dad wasn't working the 4 to 12 shift, you know, that means I'd get home from school, you know, and at 5 o'clock the TV would go on. Uh, we would watch MASH from 5 to 5.30, um, you know, maybe even 5 to 6, you know, and, uh, 
know if it was two two in a row. I don't, I don't even remember as a kid if the news came on at 5.30 or 6, whether it was a double news or not. Um, but the news would come on after MASH. National news would come on at, at 6.30, you know, and then at 7, the TV would go off, you know, and that's as a kid, and that was my routine is, you know, MASH, which is the Korean War, um, you know, and then the news, you know, and uh, so as a kid, I grew up just knowing about the Soviet Union. Um, I also grew up, uh, you know, a couple hours away from uh, Loring Air Force Base, you know, un undoubtedly a first strike target. So I knew I was living close enough to a place that uh, I wouldn't get vaporized in a first strike, but I knew it would be attacked, or, or, or at least, but I, I knew the base would be attacked. So I would probably survive, you know, the uh, you know the, the nuclear fallout from that. And that was just kind of something that was always in the back of my head kind of growing up is, you know, I'm, I'm going to be relatively close to a first strike, you know, and watching the news growing up, you see all the, you know, you you see and process all those things, you know. So anyway, the, when the Olympics happen and those kinds of things happen, they mean a lot. You know, they mean a lot when, you know, when that's your context when you're growing up. Um, you know, it's not that today anything is that much safer. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union doesn't exist, but Russia still does, and it has all the nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I don't ever remember thinking that China was this, like, major existential threat to the United States. You know, as a kid, but undoubtedly, if you've been watching, uh, you know, what's been going on internationally with China over the last decade or so, um, and I'm not talking about the genocide of the Uyghur population, I'm talking about internationally, what China has been doing, you know, then, you know, there is, uh, I mean, if anything, I would say the world is a much scarier place today than it was during the Cold War. Um, I guess the biggest difference is students today simply have the internet and have all the social media platforms. So you can kind of bury your head in all that and not even think about the realities of the world in which you're living in. Um, you don't have to think about those existential threats. So if you don't have to think about them, you don't worry about them, you don't worry about them, then things like the Olympics don't mean that much to you. So I guess hopefully it stays like that. You know, if it stays like it currently is, that means, you know, the uh, the potential risk that it does exist never ever kind of rears its head. So hopefully it stays like that forever, and you never have to you know, have those kinds of thoughts. But anyway, um, when you talk about these symbolic global victories, sorry about that, I'm a little off tangent there. Um, when you talk about these uh, symbolic global victories, you know you're the, these are a big deal, right? So the Cold War. Um, so here's a couple of examples. One is the blood in the water match. Um, and this actually isn't a, a Soviet versus U.S. kind of moment. This is, you know, this is a moment, um, you know, where it's actually Hungary, a, uh, a former Eastern or sorry, a current Eastern Bloc country when it happens. Um, you know, it is behind the Iron Curtain. And you do see this kind of moment where a rebellion breaks out and, you know, uh, and the Soviet Union comes in and crushes it, um, you know, and. And the, uh, the water polo team, you know, the Olympic team, is in Budapest when this stuff starts, but they get ushered away to Czechoslovakia where, because of the state media, they don't really see what, what happens. Like, you know, when the, when, you know, when the Red Army and the tank rolls, you know, rolls in and, and crushes, um, you know, the very short-lived rebellion, you know, and then disappears the, the leaders of it. Um, you know, so they don't see that until the eventually go to Melbourne in Australia. And when they're in Melbourne, um, you know, they watch the news there and they see what happens. So when, uh, you know, when Hungary plays the Soviet Union you know, in the water polo match, it's, it's game on. And, uh, you know, very, you know, very uh, kind of famous moment, you know, of, of, uh, of, of Olympic symbolic victories. Uh, and the Hungarians win. Right, they end up winning the game. So there's uh you can you can kind of watch in, information on this on the on the internet. Um, you know, another one of the great Olympic moments is the '72 uh, basketball game. Um, you know, in, in in class we'll typically watch. Um, you know, the, you'll typically watch this, and uh, you know we'll watch a little bit of this. And uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is the the three chances to win victory uh, by the Soviets. Um, in, uh, in the Munich games in 1972. And uh, I did make the mistake once, though, of watching the uh, this version of it. Very grammar and uh, spelling are important. I don't want to watch this, but 
if you watch this version of it, um, right? Yeah, if you watch this version of it, he actually uh, this version of it gives you the you know gives you the basketball game, the seventy two basketball game from the Russian perspective, where they interview the Russian players and then they explain everything from the Russian perspective. Um, if you watch that. Um, you know, is that Marv Albert? I think this guy's name is. Um, if you watch that perspective, um, it will take a little bit of the anger away from you from the American perspective. Um, so uh, if, if you're pretty happy, like, you know, thinking that the Soviets got away with cheating and, and all that kind of stuff, um, then I would highly discourage you watching, um, you know, watching this version of it. Um, you know, but if you want to see the the Soviet point of view on on why they think it was a valid victory, then yeah, it's you know, it's also a pretty good little exercise in perspective. You know, um, you know when you watch you know you, when you watch the American side of it, it is pretty upsetting to to see that. You know, but when you see it from the Soviet perspective, yeah, maybe. Maybe okay. Uh, anyway, there's also uh, you know probably the most famous uh, from the American perspective. You know the most famous uh, you know symbolic victory of the Olympics is the 1980 Olympic Games. Um, you know, in in class, we'll always kind of watch the trailer. Um, you know, for Miracle, if you have Disney Plus now, I would highly encourage you watch this. Um, it it is a really well done well done piece. So yeah, I would highly encourage you to watch that. All right, all right. So why the Cold War? Let's just kind of get into the kind of broader, broader stuff. Um, the Cold War is a fight over human rights. You know, it's a fight over enlightenment ideas. You know, it's a it's a fight over resources and economics and markets. Um, it's a it's a competition for alliances, and not all countries are going to play along. All right. So in the next video, we'll kind of look at the non-aligned movement. Um, and what that was, right? So, but the Cold War is a lot of things to a lot of people, right? Um, you know, when you look at, you know, why does this tension exist from the Soviet point of view um, or the post World War II from Moscow? Keep in mind, World War II from Moscow is a, it has a massive cost, right? So, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine to 14 million Soviet troops will die in World War II. Keep in mind, 8 to 20 million civilians are going to get killed as well. The death toll of, you know, of World War I for the Soviets is massive. Um, you know, the Germans had invaded twice in 30 years, um, you know, and just wreaked havoc on the Soviet Union. Um, and, of course, the Soviets are also fearful of an invasion by the United States and England, uh, just like they did after World War One. right? So don't forget that. You know, there's a there is some honesty to the distrust that exists. Uh, you know, the United States and England and France, right? We did invade Russia. You know, uh, you know, and attack the Ruds or the Reds, the Bolsheviks. Uh, we sided against, you know, Stalin. Um, you know, in, in his side uh, in the Russian Civil War. So there is some natural, legitimate distrust that exists. All right, so let's let's do a little uh, claim. You know, claim activity and, uh, you know, and a little bit of sourcing. Right. So, so here's the passage. And so read this passage. Uh, go ahead and write a historical claim for this. Analyze the causes and effects as our, you know. So <laughs> write a claim using uh, this, the prompt of analyze the causes and effects of the Cold War. And also try to source this in one way. Right? Try to source this document in one way. So please go ahead and pause that and complete the activity. All right, and welcome back. Um, all right, so some possible claim ideas. All right, Soviet mistrust of England and the United States led to scale application, uh, the breakdown of the World War One coalition into the Cold War, all right, or disputes over the status of Eastern Europe between the United States and the Soviet Union. Right, led to the Cold War. So something along those lines. As far as some sourcing ideas, um, you know, one way to source that maybe Molotov's attempting to rally the Russian people around the idea that the British and the Americans were to blame for the coming conflict because he and Stalin needed Russian support. 
there's another uh, a war begins. Or something like Molotov gives a speech as tensions were rising over control of Eastern Europe. Uh, Molotov wants to blame the British and the Americans for the tension. So the USSR uh, could justify leaving their army in Eastern Europe, right? And setting up the puppet regimes in the Eastern Bloc countries. Okay, so there's uh, another another way of doing it. All right, so the post World War II view from the United States, right, or from Washington, uh, you know, did not want the devastated nations to fall to the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, Soviet-backed communism, right? So this is why we're going to see such a massive uh, amount of support being given as a result of the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, right? So this is why you see that kind of financial support and aid being given, right? So uh, post-World War II goals, economic reconstruction of Europe, um, you know, maintain its military superiority, and containment refers to containing the spread of, of communism globally. All right. So, you know, the U.S. realized it was in a unique position in, in the aftermath of World War II. All right. So let's do a very similar thing. We're going to do a claim uh, based on the prompt, right? And our prompt is analyze the causes and effects of the Cold War. So let's do a claim based on the following document. All right, and let's try to source this document in one way. So if you're watching this from home, this is going to become a, you know, a classwork grade. So please complete this activity in class and make sure you uh, email this to me or bring it in when you return to school. And all right, so let's wrap this up. Um, events, uh, events of World War II make the prospects of maintaining empire unfeasible. And the old empires once dominated. This is what we kind of talked about yesterday with decolonization. And the global balance of power was irrevocably, irrevocably altered by the attainment of worldwide independence. And, uh, and of course, the Cold War plays right into that as well. So that is all for today. Sapriati.